Um, there might be a few of you in this room who are not totally familiar with the Board of Associates, so I'll just say a couple of words. Our job is to support the Whitehead Institute in any way we can, certainly with our own contributions, and also very importantly by spreading the word. Here in New York, uh, we have quite a job to do because Whitehead is extremely well known in academic and scientific circles. It is certainly extremely well known up in Cambridge. But here in New York, there is just so much going on that all of us here have an important assignment, and that is to tell everybody about Whitehead Institute. If there's anything here at all that captured your attention, that intrigued you, that intellectually or emotionally appeals to you, tell everybody. There are many events that we hold here throughout the year. If you have signed up for this event by email, you will be on the email distribution list for the next event. Please come, but if you cannot attend that particular event and you think of a friend or an acquaintance or somebody who should come, by all means, forward on the invitation and invite them. We welcome everybody, all events are free, and this is how we spread the word. This is an important message. Additionally, I most sincerely want to thank all of my fellow Board of Associate members in this room. Thank you for your support. And as you think about continuing your support, amplifying your support, or joining the ranks of the Board of Associate members, I want to encourage you to think about two things. The first thing I want you to think about is this. This is an exchange, right? So we support the Whitehead Institute, but the important thing for you to think about is what do you believe and feel that the Whitehead Institute is giving you, your family, humanity, all of us? Is that a valuable exchange? And if it is, what's our contribution then? And the second thing to think about, again, how does it make you feel? Does it make you feel proud? I will tell you, I feel proud to be a supporter of the Whitehead Institute. And with that, back to David. Thank you, Laerca. Um, so very, very much for all that you do, and that for all that uh, the members of the BOA here in New York City do on behalf of our mission. Now we're going to hear from uh, Alessia Levish and Dr. Jinka Wang. Uh, they will speak about their work in plant biochemistry. Uh, let me introduce the two of them because I think we're going to segue from Alessia to Jinka without uh, my intervention, so I'll, in I'll inter introduce both. First, Alessia. Alessia is a graduate student, a PhD student at MIT. She's studying in this uh, specialized plant metabolism. Specialized, you might have heard of metabolism, but just I'll, I'll stick, it, stick it in for your... Um, uh, your, your knowledge, by the, uh, the time we're done here, you're going to know what specialized metabolism is. On the level of molecular, she's studying that on the level of molecular evolution in Jinka's lab at Whitehead. And in addition to research, uh, Alessia takes courses at the MIT Sloan School of Management. And she has worked on projects for the CVS Minute Clinic and she's also worked on projects for local Boston venture capital firms. She graduated from honors, uh, with honors from Stony Brook University with a degree in biochemistry. Jinka is a member of Whitehead Institute and he is the Thomas D. and Virginia W. Cabot Career Development Assistant Professor of Biology at MIT. Jinka's research focuses on understanding the origin and the evolution of that, not just metabolism, specialized metabolism. Jinka would never work on ordinary metabolism. He only works on specialized metabolism, uh, and he does that in plants. And Jinka is particularly interested in understanding 
the molecular bases of traditional herbal medicines and developing new nature-inspired therapeutics for treating various human diseases. I'm particularly excited to hear from both of them now. So, Alessia. Thank you, Mark, for that introduction, David. Um, is this microphone working? Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here today at the 2017 Whitehead Symposium. Before I say anything else, I would like to thank everybody who's given me an opportunity to be here. Uh, so my name is Alessia Levge, and as David mentioned, I'm a graduate student in the laboratory of Jinko Wang. And in trying to keep with the theme of plant biology that we have going today, actually I've included an image of a scanning electron micrograph of Arabidopsis uh, plant pollen. So this is the plant that Mary talked extensively about. Uh, this was an image taken by my colleague in the lab, Joe Jacobowitz. Um, so my goal today is to tell you a little bit about my journey and in doing so really give you a perspective of what it's like to be a trainee, um, but not just any trainee, a trainee um, with all of the benefits that I receive by being um, particularly in the Whitehead Institute. Um, and so in order to start uh, this journey, I want to first preface how I even became interested in pursuing a PhD. So I did study biochemistry at the Stony Brook University and I played around with the idea of multiple career trajectories. So I was interested perhaps in teaching or in medicine. Um, but very early on, I actually had the fortune to join a very good lab in chemical biology. And ever since that moment, I've been so captivated by research. Um, and so when the time came, I started applying to many graduate programs across the country. And I was absolutely elated when I heard back from the biology department at MIT. Here is an overview of the MIT campus facing the Charles River uh, and Boston across the river. And really, MIT is at the forefront of so many disciplines, and there's a reason for that. It's got this incredible concentration of just brilliant minds who are able to come up with the most creative ideas and these people that are so motivated and so captivated by what they work on that they're really able to mobilize the science and bring it into the world. And so I was so excited to be a part of this campus, to be a part of MIT. And so what followed is what I like to call a bit of an unexpected journey into uh, plant biology. And I say it's unexpected because somewhat naively, I never was interested in plant biology. I never thought that you could ask interesting questions using plants as a system. And I think this is a misconception of a lot of scientists, which Jinko, when I met him, really cleared up for me. He really opened my eyes to the breadth and the depth of different phenomena that you could study using plant systems. And so since my joining the lab about three years ago, I've worked with all of the different plants illustrated on this slide to some capacity. Um, and so Arabidopsis is all the way on the left. Again, this is the plant from which the pollen um, on the first slide was extracted. And so there's something interesting about the plants that I'm showing you on this slide, because a few of these are model organisms. So Mary touched on this a little bit. This just means that they're organisms that have a lot of tools available for them. And so many researchers like to use these organisms in order to, to study very detailed molecular biology, very important fundamental stuff. Um, but actually, two of these other plants on the slide are non-model organisms. So they have much fewer tools available to them. And you have to ask different questions when approaching these kinds of plants. Um, and Jinka, when he gives his talk, will go into the benefits of why it's important to use non-model systems and what we can learn about human health by doing so. And so by studying all of these systems, I've actually been able to use such a wide range of disciplines within biology itself. For instance, I've used biochemistry, the study of how these chemical molecules are made in the context of a biological organism. These chemical molecules comprise the metabolism of the organism. I have used enzymology as well. So enzymology is the study of these protein catalysts that are able to make the chemical molecules that comprise the metabolism of any given organism. One of my favorite ones has been structural biology. So what this is, is you can shine an X-ray through a protein crystal and obtain a diffraction pattern, which looks like a series of dots on a film, as you see here. And the remarkable thing is that you can take these dots and from it actually build a three-dimensional model of the protein that you're trying to study. It's just captivating. 
One that I never imagined I would use because I was so terrible at it was genetics. Um, but I like to think that I became a little bit more skilled at this in my time in the lab. And I've also thought about many questions in the context of evolution, both on the molecular levels and on the organismal levels. And so let me tell you a little bit about my current project, which actually utilizes the two non-model organisms of the previous slide. The reason these organisms are interesting to me, these two plants, is because they make this molecule called rosmarinic acid. Rosmarinic acid is a little bit of a miracle molecule in the sense that it seems that several times a month somebody is publishing papers about how this compound alleviates symptoms associated with cancer or neurodegenerative disease, or how it even has effects in prolonging lifespan, or how it's this very potent antioxidant. Really, the list seems to go on. And so, People have known for many years that coleus makes rosmarinic acid, and they've even identified the molecular machines in the plant that are able to do this. And although people have also known that this desert bell plant also makes the same compound, nobody has ever characterized this on a molecular level. And in fact, when we looked, we couldn't find those same molecular machines. So what does this mean? If you allow me to draw a rather simple um, analogy, to my walk home at the end of the night from the Whitehead Institute, this means that coleus seems to be taking one route to produce this molecule to get to that final endpoint. And desert bells are using a completely different route. And why is this interesting? Why do I want to study something like this? Um, there are really two reasons. One is a pure curiosity of how and why plants might want to do something like this and how this contributes to the metabolic diversity and ingenuity that we see in plants today. But the other reason is a little bit more practical. So if we find, for instance, that these molecular machines in desert bells are actually more effective at making this molecule, then we can take it to another discipline in biology called synthetic biology. And we can put these molecular machines into uh, simpler organisms such as bacteria or yeast. And then we can grow these up and essentially have them make cellular factories for us that can make this rosmarinic acid molecule much more effectively and in a much more cost-effective way, therefore making it more available to the public. So you may have noticed that in my talk, um, I've stressed over and over again this concept of non-model organisms, and there really is a reason for that. So the thing I like, uh, I really appreciate about Jinka's lab is that his combination of approaches allows me to study the nuts and bolts of a system, the really fine molecular biological details of how something works, but it also allows me to approach problems from a much broader perspective and act, look at the big picture and ask some very large questions. And so these two approaches are very complementary and of course both are very fundamental to performing good science. But one can imagine how studying the metaphorical forest can be a very risky and expensive endeavor. And so with this regard, I really appreciate being in an environment like the Whitehead Institute um, that combines both public and private funding sources because in fact, public funds such as the NIH and the NSF often stray away from making investments in this big picture science. Um, and so it allows, by being in the Whitehead Institute, um, I'm really allowed to ask uh, and to learn how to ask questions from both perspectives. The other part that I really enjoy about being at the Whitehead Institute is that it's entrenched in this ecosystem that Harvey touched upon. And it really does exist in what I think is a 10-acre Silicon Valley of biotech. It's just this dense area of ideas that have been mobilized into the world and have changed people's lives. And being entrenched in all of this, I really couldn't help but become interested in other aspects of science such as the, entrepreneur, uh, the entrepreneurship that goes into them, or the business strategy that goes into making an idea something more practical. And luckily for me, there is actually a very, um, another very famous part of the MIT campus entrenched within all of this, which is the MIT Sloan School of Business. And so I was able to go there and learn from some really top-notch faculty um, about all of these other interests that I had acquired throughout my time at the Whitehead. And so I think that really my, it's the combination of my experiences at MIT as well as the Sloan School of Business and of course my training at the Whitehead Institute that has allowed me to become interested in a less traditional career path for scientists, which is venture capital. 
Um, and I really do think that Whitehead trainees and Whitehead alumni have been able to be successful in such a broad depth, um, a broad range of disciplines because they not only learn how to do great science from top-notch faculty, but they can also observe and learn from the model of how the institute is run. And then they can take both of these things with them to, to tackle their next challenge. And then whether this challenge is purely scientific or a combination of science and entrepreneurship, they really find themselves being successful at it. Um, and by being in this environment, I feel very encouraged to pursue this career path, even though it is a little bit untraditional. And so I'm excited to learn more um, and have the opportunity to really take the most uh, creative and the biggest ideas out of the box and learn how to mobilize them into the world. And so with that, I'd just like to thank you all for taking an opportunity to listen to me this uh, afternoon. I'd like to thank Dr. David Page again for his warm introduction, but also for being a wonderful director of the Whitehead Institute. My mentor, uh, Dr. Jinko Wang, for always supporting me, um, even though I may not have the most sort of uh, traditional career goals in mind. And everyone at the adva Institutional Advancement Office for putting together this lovely event, um, as well as Meg and Priya, who have worked with me. Um, and with that, I'd like to invite Jinka to come to the podium and tell you more about what we do in our lab. Thank you. Okay, can everybody hear me? Thank you, Alicia. I feel so proud to see my student coming up to this podium and speak very confidently about herself, the science, and her uh, future aspiration. It's just the, the kind of the happiest moment being a PI, a mentor in, in, uh, in the University of Whitehead Institute. All right, so today I am on a mission to, to do a tango here. Uh, since I don't have my partner here, I'll try to tango with these molecules. Um, so what I'm showing here is probably how uh, biologists got interested in biology. Um, so we're immediately kind of absorbed by looking at this cheetah, but I, I'm just trying to have you focus on the background. Uh, so I would say 99% of people when seeing this, oh, animals. But we're actually, Mary and I and uh, many other plant biologists, we we're just uh, fascinated by this greenness behind. Uh, so we have to realize Plants are the primary producer for the planets. They support the, the survival for all animals on it. And this is what we were interested about. So um, there are many plants that are way more interesting than grass. Uh, that's why we get captivated all the time. So since Harvey provided a personal journey about Whitehead, I, I also I kind of structured my talk today to be very personal. So this has actually got me obsessed with plants when I was a nine-year-old. So there's a summer, uh, I, I joined a, a, a summer camp, which was hosted by a local botanical garden. So we, we stayed there for one week. We learned about a lot about plants and they had this wonderful exhibitions about uh, plants from South America, including this mora tree. Uh, at the time they told us this, the, the root is as tall as the, as the door. So I kind of memorized this as a, as a door tree. And afterwards I went to my parents Dad, I, I, I want to go to South America. I want to travel to South America and see this. And at the time, it was um, early 90s, and uh, we're not a very rich family. But no, no, that's impossible. We, we can't support that. So, but luckily, uh, actually, from supports from Jeff Tarr, who's in the audience, he gave us a, a nice gift to facilitate this very wonderful field trip to Panama. Uh, and I was able to see this tree in real life uh, for the first time in my life. It was just so fabulous. And there's some other plants which are just so fabulous and uh, kept me captivated. For example, this largest flower in the world, uh, known as corpse flower. Not only it flowers once every 10 years, you can watch it, I think, in many botanical gardens. If it happens, there's a YouTube live video, you'll be able to see it. And also, it smells like corpse. It's very stinky. Uh, it's a very unique way for the plant to attract uh, pollinators. Uh, and there, there's another fact that I, I was born in a scientist family and my dad is actually a biogeochemist. He was trained as a geologist who does the chemistry of the earth. And this is, um, his students uh, went to Antarctica recently and they, they were uh, sending some very nice pictures about the, those mosses that surviving this very extreme environment. 
So we ha you have to imagine that these plants have to sustain life for six months of darkness. So there's a, a, a new opportunity for my lab to explore maybe in the next few years. And for everybody, uh, you don't have to go to extreme places. You can go back to your backyard garden. Uh, plants are just beautiful. They calm us down, down. and uh, Suya Garden, which is in uh, Maine and near Acadia National Park. I also want to acknowledge Alan Kleinlein, who, who hosted my family to stay with them in the past few, few summer. And we discovered this very lovely garden with beautiful flowers. Um, so plants are wonderful. Uh, hopefully I have convinced you. Uh, but to myself, uh, starting grad school, it, it's a revelation of another layer of the reality. So we, I start to realize there's this unseen uh, world about plants that very few people actually realize. This is the world of chemicals. So s plants are different from uh, animals. They don't move around. So once they're seeded, they're trapped. So their way to deal with the environment is entirely through uh, chemical communication. And I would argue that this vast chemical space in the, in the plant kingdom is largely unexplored. And that makes uh, us um, kind of a lot of fun to, to explore this unknown territory. So here are just examples that the biological aspect about plants we study in the lab. Uh, for example, when plants are under drought stress, they synthesize this molecule called abscisic acid that regulate very specialized physiology under that stress. Uh, Alicia has shown some beautiful pictures about this plant pollen. It happens there is a very inert polymer that covers these, um, uh, uh, these gametes to protect them under very harsh environment. Many plants produce volatiles. That's why the flowers smell so good. And in nature, these molecules are essential to attract the right pollinators, which are uh, essential for their life cycle. And a huge battery array of molecules that's serving as protective compounds, preventing the plant to be eaten by uh, pathogens and other herbivores. And as a result, as humans, we learn how to appreciate plants or enjoy the benefits coming from plants. We have many things laid on our table, coffee, wine, and we use spice for cooking. These are all the benefits that plants can provide to us. Plants have, have been a very important source for medicine. So many different cultures have independently evolved um, traditional medicine systems to, to battle disease. And over the last 100 years, many single molecules have been identified from their uh, native medicinal plant host and made into the clinic. So these are just a summary of some of the single molecule plant natural products, uh, some are derived from them, eventually become approved by FDA and fighting very important diseases. And the molecular mechanisms underlying their action are also quite remarkable. So as you see, these are quite uh, specific molecules that tackle very important targets in our body, um, many serving uh, as anti-cancer drugs, some are for pain uh, relieving uh, activities. So just remarkable space are still await us to further explore. Um, so the, the, the happy part of being a scientist is always to discover. So that's always keeping us forward. I think I really share uh, this with my colleagues at Whitehead. Um, so studying plant biology also brings us to different parts of the world. So this is also a, a part that I truly enjoy. Um, so the first story I'm going to tell you today is actually coming from uh, this little island uh, from um, the South Pacific uh, Ocean. So I heard about this story uh, in a local seminar given by an uh, ethnobotanist. And he was talking about his expedition into um, Polynesian islands and how uh, those local people are using this plant called kava kava tr to, to treat um, anxiety and also calming people down. It's actually this plant is at the center of local culture. Um, so they have this rituals where people consume uh, many bowls of kava drink over, over, overnight. And through these events, conflicts between tribes got resolved and um, culture knowledge about the tribes got passed down to the generation. Uh, it's a remarkable plant and it's, it belongs to the piper family, which is related to black pepper. And these plants grow a very big root and you can buy these uh, in from the local markets and that's how uh, you make this, this drink. 
So I, I, I became very interested in this, just sitting in the audience. I would say the best thing, one of the best inventions in the past uh, 20 years is Wikipedia. And, and mobile phone, you start looking at the plant and there's one molecule just popped up. So it's called cavalactone. So it happens that the phytochemists, there are many good phytochemists around, they have done the chemistry. They have identified there is this very specialized, specialized class of molecules that do exist in these plants. And they're made at a very, very high level. So just to give some perspective, 20% of the dry weight of this root is this compound or the, the compound related to that. Uh, if you think about plant material, you typically think about fiber, right? For a small molecule to accumulate at this high level is quite remarkable. So there are some other related compounds. Um, uh, sorry, this just bore you with some chemistry. So these are called flavor carvings. These are also quite specialized, but they are more related to some of the other flavonoids we found in, in plants we're more familiar with. Uh, very interestingly, kava kava also accumulates toxic compounds. For example, this particular alkaloid is toxic to liver, but this compound is only accumulating at, at the upper ground part of the plant, so like in the leaves. And the local people actually learned never to consume the, the, the upper part of the plant. And it's, it's quite important. There has been reportedly some uh, uh, toxication cases because people didn't know. They just grind up the whole plant and they got toxified. Um, so plants are actually quite remarkable chemists. So it's not, they're not just making one compound, they're doing experiments all the time. So about 90 cavalactone related compounds in total called cavalactones have been identified from this class of plants. Six of them are uh, the primary accumulators. Um, so so that, that's enough to start a project in my lab. So, the first thing we did is we went to Amazon. So we, we bought some kava extract, uh, back, bring back in the, to the lab and, and did a very simple uh, chemical analysis. This is called uh, LCMS-based uh, metabolic uh, profiling. So indeed, in this pouch we bought, it contains a lot of kava lactones. As you've seen at the top, there are six major peaks. So these are the six kava lactones I've shown. Um, some other traces down there that's showing related species, um, plants of the same genus, but not this particular plant, do not make them. So including black pepper and also uh, piper beetle, which is a, a plant consumed in Vietnamese uh, cuisine, people eat as a salad, they do not produce them. That justify, oh, these are really specialized compounds. So that means the evolution of the pathway underlying their biosynthesis must have arisen relatively recently. And I also, I was trained as a chemist, a biochemist. So looking at the structure, I immediately realized that there, there is a very strong hypothesis behind uh, the emergence of this new trait in, in just this kava plant. So we, we know from other people's work that there is this ancestral gene called CHS, which is responsible for making all the purple pigments you see in plants. So these are known as flavonoids. Flavor covering on the right, so these are specialized in kava. They're just modified versions of this, this traditional route that exists in all plants. So how do kava lactones are made in kava? So we hypothesize that there must be a CHS-like gene encoding another enzyme and doing a little slightly different chemistry. Instead of making a so-called tetraketide, it makes a triketide. When that happens, it'll cyclize in a different way and then give rise to this pyrone and you only see this in, in kava kava plant, but not the other piper plant. So we decided to figure out the molecular basis for that in kava plant. But one immediate challenge for that is kava kava is just a wild species. It's not like Arabidopsis. it's not a model system. There's a lot of challenges to be able to study that. <coughs> Excuse me. So over, over the years, over the past three and a half years in my lab, we have developed new tools to allow scientists to look at species that are, are not traditional model species. So it's really facilitated by so-called omics type of studies. So we combine, in this case, we combine sequencing technology. We do a, a technique called transcriptomics and also metabolic profiling technology called metabolomics. We sequence and also metabolically 
profile different tissues from a, a wild plant and do a lot of computational biology and correlate the genes with these chemical traits that are in interesting. For example, here, carbolactone. So this, this, this new workflow has worked wonderfully for many of the cases, including the, the cover cover plant. So we were able to identify genes, which I just talked about, CHS, and there are new genes that only emerge in this one species. So I, in here, I named CHS like one and like two. So they're derived from CHS through this process known as gene duplication followed by new functionalization. And we were able to clone them, assay their biochemical activities. Indeed, these two newly derived genes in this one species have acquired new biochemical functions that give rise to carbolactone backbones. Um, so this is just to illustrate a very general workflow. We were able to use the same technology and identify the other additional enzymes uh, required to modify this molecule in different ways. Through this knowledge, at this point, we can use uh, the means of synthetic biology, which I'll get into in more details, and create, recreate carbolactones in the lab through an entirely synthetic approach. So these are the six, six carbolactones we can make in the lab through uh, synthetic biochemistry using the knowledge we learned from, uh, from these studies. Uh, I want to illustrate the scientists who's behind the work. Uh, so this work was carried out by very talented postdoc, Tomasz Floskel. So he, he before coming to, to Cambridge, he was in Okinawa practicing karate. And he's actually has risen to very high level. Um, so he told me that he never had to use this in real fighting. <coughs> but he actually using this spirit on every single day. Really great mentality for a scientist. Um, so he's not satisfied from just understanding how kava is making kava lactones. He wants to understand how kava lactones interact with our body. So he learned how traditional, the traditional way of preparing a kava drink, and this is a practice he did in his home together with his wife. And I have to pre-warn you if you want to try this. It, it's one of those worst tasting herbal tea ever. It tastes peppery and bitter. Um, but the, the result, as he reported, <laughs> great. Uh, so following that, I also tried myself. So the first time I had it, I had to sleep for 14 hours. So it's really great, uh, calming uh, drink, although it tastes really bad. It, it, it works. Um, and I realized this is actually a way of doing reverse phase clinical trials. We are taking things that have been consumed by humans for thousands of years. Now we're trying to kind of reverse the process and study their action mechanisms in lower animals. So we felt now it's safe enough to test on some fish. Uh, so Tavi talked about collaboration uh, spirit at Whitehead. So it happens, Hazel Sif, who's another member at Whitehead Institute, who studies uh, fish development. And she has her fish uh, facility just in front of our lab. So the first two years, I thought that's really inconvenient because it could be my space. <laughs> um, but I realized it, there's such a great benefit because I walk by on every single day, I just realized you can use fish to, to study the drug mechanisms of, of these natural products we're interested in. So on the right, you are seeing this fish getting, uh, I, would, I would yeah say drunk or uh, uh, influenced by carbolactones and having a hard, hard time maintaining its balance, but trust me, it's, it's not dead. So once you scoop it out, put it in the regular water, it, 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 it'll, it'll live. So it happens that there has been a great deal of work using zebrafish as a model to study anxiety. So this is really great for us. So, uh, so in fish, if, if they're calm, they tend to stay in the middle of the well, but w once they're stressed, they tend to kind of swim around. And this can be captured by videotaping. And this is really uh, leveraging the facility that Hazel Sips lab offers. So we use that. We have uh, pr produced single kava lactones and also the kava extract as a whole. So we can add those extract and single compounds into the well and, and track fish movement. Um, by doing so, we verified that almost all kava lactones we tested, six of them, mostly on the right, so lower dose, higher dose, can slow down fish movement. So this is very similar to human experience. If you're going through a, a night-long kava session, you just 
ended up sitting there, you don't want to move around. This is exactly what uh, it does to the fish. Uh, on, on here, I don't have a pointer, maybe I do, but there's one cavalactone that doesn't have this uh, activity called yangonin. But we found this yangonin, which carries a very interesting, unique modification, um, as I pointed here, that, that's not um, there for the other cavalactones. So this one has the best uh, effect in reducing the anxiety level. And from just reading some literature, we found most of cavalactones are GABA receptor agonists, whereas yangonin is a weak endocannabinoid receptor agonist. So when consuming this mixture from the, the drink, we're actually having a very complicated interaction of the plant molecules with our body. And we're, we're still pursuing this work to really to understand how, how these molecules working with us to get to these uh, activities we're describing. And ultimately, I really think th this provides a potentially a new lead towards uh, anti, uh, in insomnia, anti-anxiety medication. So you may ask why this is useful, and especially coming to MIT, I, I got so inspired uh, from this engineering perspective. Once we understand something, we should be able to engineer it. And this is just a quote from my scientific hero, Richard Feynman. If I don't understand, I can't engineer. So we, we start to take the same mentality. We're increasing our knowledge about specialized metabolism. So these are really uncharted territory in plant uh, kingdom. So there are so many metabolic pathways we don't know. But once we understand how the pathways, what the enzymes, compose these pathways, we should be able to engineer it. So the way we do this is through a, a, a methodology called metabolic engineering, and we use microbes, typically yeast and E. coli, as the carrier to produce or to, to combine those pathways and produce those natural products we want to produce. And just like brewing a beer, and one day you'll be able to make these high-value compounds. Um, so I, I'm just going to illustrate this work through uh, another study uh, from my, uh, another postdoc, Mike uh, Spence. So he's a very seasoned enzymologist and structural biologist. So he has done wonderful work in basic science, uh, understanding the structural basis for this divergent evolution of uh, enzyme family. So I'm not gonna to go into this, but from this study, he realized that he can translate the knowledge learned to a very practical issue. Um, so this, this story also kind of brought us to another parts of the world, Tibet. So in Tibet, if you go there, local people will offer you a tea, which is um, made from this plant uh, called golden root, uh, rhodiola. And these plants really survive well in Tibet, and people trying to uh, kind of grow this elsewhere, but it doesn't have the same medicinal properties if you grow in other, other places. That means the environmental factors contribute to the biosynthesis of these compounds. And the effect for these is to really increase your endurance at high altitudes. So people have done a lot of studies ab about the plant and they found there's a molecule from the plant which can explains most of the bioactivity of this plant. So this is called siligicide. Because of, of its very good health benefit, uh, this rhodiola plant has been over harvested. So there's a really bad thing about knowing more about the medicinal property of plants. Some could be endangered, some can, are really wiped out because people are doing a lot of illegal harvesting. We realized that through Mike's previous study, we can actually in identify a pathway to make it. And financially, it'll make a lot of sense because there's no way people can synthesize this compound through organic chemistry. That's why you have to pay $200 to buy one milligram of this, this compound from this company we, uh, most of the scientists use. So in this particular study, Mike was able to identify three essential genes from rhodiola, converting tyrosine, which is one of the 20 amino acids, costs $40 per kilogram, and make a lot of siligicide. So this is the first successful case we, we demonstrated in the lab. You can, you can actually uh, uh, cash out based on the knowledge you learned in, from basic science and create something very valuable and useful for uh, medicine. So here is another uh, uh, example which involves red algae. And, and as David alluded that um, we are very attracted to very exotic things. So this is uh, 
another source of very high value anti-cancer compounds. So there have been a lot of great work has been done in the chemistry of these organisms. So they make this class of, of compounds known as terpenoids. And these compounds are modified in a very unique way. So as you can see in the color, they're oftentimes halogenated. They're bromine, chlorine modifications. And these modifications are essential and contributing to their bioactivity. Um, but they're extremely source limited. You can potentially collect a few red algae off the coast, but for large uh, scale production, it's very infeasible. Um, so this work was carried out by uh, another postdoc who came from San Diego, and he's a image diver, and this is him scuba diving off the coast of Panama, this trip we went and looking for red algae. Um, so in this particular work, I also want to highlight this collaboration I, I, I do with um, Makoto Fujita's group at University of Tokyo. So at the time I joined Whitehead, I read this paper uh, on nature published from the Fujita group. So they identify a new way to identify, to solve the small molecule structure at very, very low quantity. So this, m this methodology is called crystalline sponge method. So the idea is that you can preform a crystalline using defined material and you just pour in this analyte you're interested in. So this can be at a very, very low abundance. And once all these analyte adopt certain conformation in the cavity of this crystalline, then you take that for X-ray crystallography and solve the structure of the whole thing. In the same time, you will solve the structure of your small molecule. Um, so this is the details. This is the material. You make this porous crystalline material, and then you can soak your crystal in this solvent with your analyte in it. And then over the course of two days, your molecules get into the, the pores of the crystalline and you take this for, to do X-ray crystallography. You get those diffraction patterns and then you solve this, the absolute conformation of this small molecule in the cavity. So this has been a very lengthy process. Without this, you would take tens of million grams of materials and takes very experienced scientists to spend months to get this structure. Now we only need nanogram to microgram quantity of the same material and get to the same result. So this is really enabling research in my lab. Uh, so for this particular red algae project, we, we started using synthetic biology approach. We took just a little cluster of the plant material, sequence its transcriptome, and we're also gonna to sequence the genome. And from the previous knowledge, we identified genes responsible for those valuable natural product biosynthesis, engineered the pathway in yeast, producing the same molecule, identified their structures using this crystalline sponge technology. So this is a really a new workflow for us to access high value and medicinal natural products. So from all this research I described to you, we're, I'm, I'm trying to propose, we're, we're developing a new way where the medicinal compounds from plants can be harnessed. So these are the plants. Because of those advances in other fields, like genomics, knowledge about plant natural part of our synthesis, synthetic DNA technology, and the ways that allow us to engineer microbes, really allow us to access these metabolites through the means of synthetic biology. And using that, we can not only recreate the, the chemical diversity offered by the plant kingdom, but we can also expand that diversity because we have the ability to mix genes and enzymes from different hosts. And all these will create new chemical entities that can feed into pharmaceutical development. So we're in the process of doing something really uh, wonderful and exciting. And this is the group uh, who really kind of do the work behind everything I presented. Uh, I really want to thank my uh, Whitehead colleagues for offering this such a wonderful place to to spend time on a daily basis and all the funding agencies that provide funding for this research. Thank you very much. And <laughs> I'll be happy to answer questions. And if you have a question for Alicia, please also do that. So I'm just wondering if someone at Whitehead has undertaken or has it already been done elsewhere? Um, yeah, so I'm always interested in cannabis research, although at the federal level, it, it is still illegal. So I think there are some 
uh, gray area because it's legal in the state level but not legal federal level. Uh, I have colleagues from Canada who's done cannabis uh, cannabinoid biosynthesis, which is actually very related to the kava lactone biosynthesis. It's the same biochemical mechanisms. There are also the chemical diversities of cannabinoids, which we really want to learn, right? The, by learning cannabinoids, we, we reveal that there's this endocannabinoid signaling pathway in our own, own body. And there are different cannabinoids have very different uh, functionalities that interact with us. It's a very rich study. For now, we haven't, I don't think any of our colleagues have touched it, but I, I'm always interested in that. When I spend my winters in La Jolla, I get to see a lot of people doing research on developing all kinds of drugs and natural products that come from the sea. This is the uh, Scripps Institution of Oceanography. What they tell me is they have a hard time getting drug companies to take them up on using these things because they're all natural products and they can't patent it, so they don't have intellectual property rights. Or is that going to be a problem with plant-based materials that the drug companies will say, well, you know, it's a great thing, good cure, but we can't make any money on it? Yeah, so it's a great question, and I, I would uh, respond this in two different aspects. So the first one is uh, the source issue. I think a lot of pharmaceutical companies can't develop it further because there is no stable uh, supply of the material. All these natural products have to be isolated from their nature, natural host. For marine organisms, it's extremely difficult. It's maybe slightly easier for plants. So this, the second, regarding uh, the intellectual protection, uh, property protection about the structure. So we think the, the approach we're taking, using synthetic biology, really allow us to create new chemical entities. You start with a molecule with activity but then you can further decorate using enzymes potentially from other hosts, making an analog of that, and maybe have even improved activity. And then you, you can patent the structure. So this is the benefit. Right, so CHS, uh, which is short for charcoal synthase, is a conserved enzyme for an all land plants. So it's actually essential for the plants' survival to survive in the, in the terrestrial environment. We also find a, 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 a canonical CHS in kava plant. They have it, so serving conserved function. But CHS-like genes, which eventually become the kava lactone synthase, these are very specialized. They only evolved in this particular lineage of plants. So this is a process of specialization. That's why every single plant we analyzed have very different chemical profiles. It's very often time following very similar evolutionary principles. Any questions? Or for Alexia, if you have. All right, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Jinka. Thank you, Alessia. That was uh, extremely thought-provoking on any number of levels. Um, uh, something I want to point out, just in, in passing, on your table, you may have noticed these things that at first blush look like pieces of jigsaw puzzles, but on closer inspection are flowers. Um, it turns out that these are biodegradable, and they are embedded with wildflower seeds. So you can take these home and plant them. Um, uh, so do take them home, plant them, and think of Whitehead when, the, when your plants bloom. Um, and, and with that, I would um, like to thank 
again, our, our, our faculty speakers, and Alicia is terrific. I wanna, and I want to thank all of you who came to spend the morning with us. I want to thank you for attending our symposium this morning. I hope you will leave here with a great understanding of Whitehead Institute, of plant biology research, and of its present and future impact on human disease. We, look, we at Whitehead look forward to remaining in contact with you and to seeing you again soon. And I wish you a fine afternoon and the rest of the weekend. So thank you very much for joining us. All right. and, and I should say that there is now uh, coffee and, uh, and a few pastries to nibble on. So linger, please. Thank you.